صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا ابي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله بيعف توفيق to continue our discussion on followership so far we have talked about piety, sincerity, about obedience, about not being biased, and loyalty. Tonight, inshallah, we want to talk about a few more characteristics. So, especially uh, about truthfulness and keeping confidentiality. This is very important. Yes. So let's start first with truthfulness. A believer especially when he or she wants to be part of a universal movement for a spreading light in the world, justice, peace, cannot be a liar or dishonest person. Truthfulness is very fundamental quality. And indeed, I believe it's the most fundamental quality in ethics. Let's mention a few hadith and see how Ahlul Bayt have introduced to us the significance of Sidq and Haqq. There is a beautiful hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. <laughs> in which he says, La taghtarru bisalatihim wala bisiyamihim. Don't be deceived by, don't be deceived by their fasting or praying. For example, you want to marry, you want to, I don't know, choose someone as friend, you want to start business with someone, you know, partner, you want to choose someone for community positions. One thing that comes to our mind quickly is that if someone is praying, or fasting, this means that he's a good person. There are people who don't pray, don't fast. Yes, those who don't pray and fast are not qualified for such things that I mentioned. We don't want to say they are bad people or good people, but they are not qualified for marriage, for, I don't know, becoming, you know, members of our executive committee of the mosque, you know. <laughs> what does it mean that someone is not praying and fasting and I was wearing hijab, for example, this type of thing, and put them in executive committee? It doesn't mean. But it's not just enough that they pray and fast. There are people who pray and fast and they have no sincerity, unfortunately. This has become habit. It is true that in a salat tanha an al fahsha wal munkar. Salat stops doing bad things. 
But the Quran itself says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُمْ Quran warns some people who say prayer because they have not taken their prayer seriously. I can say prayer and benefit from my prayer and day by day become better and better. I can say my prayer and don't benefit even for years. Or even, na'uzu billah, worse, sometimes people, through their prayer, they become worse. Because they become proud, for example, or they show off. So Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, لا تغتروا بالصلاتهم ولا بالصيامهم Don't be deceived by their prayer or fasting. فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلُ رُبَمَا لَهِجَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالصَّوْمِ حَتَّى لَوْ تَرَكَهُ اسْتَوْحَشَ Sometimes a person has so much said prayer or fasted that now if he stops or she stops would feel bad. It has become a habit. You know, any habit, whether it is religious or not, when you don't do it, you feel bad. Yeah? Even if you have a habit of smoking, if you have a habit of, I don't know, eating something, habit of, um, I don't know, checking certain, you know, websites. If you don't do that, you feel not good. So for some people, prayer has become just a habit. It's not really prayer. Yeah? You know, in human relations, we better understand the difference. But when it comes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it's not physical, we don't understand. You know, imagine a person who comes to visit you out of love, or a person who comes and visits you as a habit. Like caretaker of, for example, the building. Maybe every day, you know... He, he meets me and I meet him, you know, but it's not really, although it can be very intimate, but many times it's just habit. We see people on the street, maybe sometimes we see our, you know, shop, local shopkeeper, you know. It's not, there is no esprit many times. Salat can become like this, fasting can become, Quran can become like this. It becomes a habit, becomes a routine, just repetitive. And if he stops this, he feels bad. Not bad in the sense that mu'min feels bad, you know. When you don't say prayer, you feel bad because you love to talk to Allah. But these people feel bad because they're used to it. And you know, the difference appears very clearly when you are supposed not to fast, for example. For example, every year you have been fasting, but this year you are ill and you know that it's harmful and you must not fast. Or you are musafir, you must not fast. Some people say, I must fast. I cannot, <laughs> you know break my fasting. All years I have been fasting. Okay, this fasting is not pleasing to Allah. If it's harming you, or if you are musafir, you cannot fast. No, I must fast. Then this shows that this is a habit. Otherwise, if you are pleasing Allah, when He says don't fast, you must not fast. So, what should we do if you ask Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, okay, you told us not to judge based on their prayer and fasting in the sense that these are important but not enough. Yeah? We have necessary condition and we have sufficient condition. This is necessary but not sufficient. What should we do? وَلَكِنْ اِخْتَبِرُوهُمْ عِنْدَ صِدْقِ الْحَدِيثِ وَأَدَاءِ الْأَمَانَةِ Test them when telling truth 
and delivery of trust are needed. Are they telling the truth or not? Are they trustworthy or not? You may say, maybe telling truth also becomes a habit. What's the answer? The answer is that actually telling truth doesn't become a habit unless you develop a quality. Why? Because telling truth is not one thing that you repeat it 1,000 times and then it becomes a habit, you do it automatically. There are so many different types of things to say in different contexts. It never becomes habit in the sense that you do it unconsciously. You know? Sometimes, for example, those who live in a, for example, you know, holy city, because they are used to, for example, every day see the dome and they say salam. This is very good. But if it becomes a habit, in the sense that you automatically do it without understanding, it becomes just a reflex. There is not that much value. Yeah? But telling truth cannot become a habit like this because it's not one thing. There are many, many circumstances with respect to different people about different issues. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult, something, sometimes maybe you feel you will be appreciated, sometimes you feel even you may not be appreciated. So they never become habit in the sense that you lose your consciousness. So, telling truth and trustworthiness are two things that Imam Sadiq says you can test people, examine people with these two. So, a true follower of Ahlul Bayt a true follower of Imam Mahdi a true helper of Imam salam, must be someone that people never doubt what he or she says. If people hear lies from me, or not lies, even in accuracy, I'm not careful, I exaggerate too much, you know, I say something with lots of exaggeration. This is again like lying. Don't say, you know, no, there was something, I just added to it. Again, this is lying. Yeah? So if you have seen someone doing something, but then you put, for example, sometimes, you know, in a good way, maybe our intention is not bad, but still it's not good. For example, we are talking about a dead person. Say, so he was always doing Salatul Layl. My late father was always doing Salatul Layl. Really, always? When you say always, do you mean what is always? Even if he 90% of the days did this, you cannot say always. We have always, we have usually, we have often, we have sometimes, we have rarely. <laughs> there are different things. If you uh, listen carefully to what we say, we mostly use two things, always, never. You never listen to me. Never. Yes, yeah, sometimes. So why you say never? So either we say always or never. These are lies. But they look not significant. So Mormon 
should have measure for everything. Not only we should not say something which is not true at all, we should not also say something which is partially true as a complete truth or added to it or removed from it, removed from it, no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Alaykum bis-sidq fa-innahu babun min abwaab al-jannah Sidq is a gate of the gates of heaven and you must try to have it Alaykum bis-sidq I need to add a point here. Whenever you hear something is a gate of heaven, it doesn't mean that it is not necessary. So no one should say, okay, Sidq is one gate of heaven, but liars can go from other gates. <laughs> because there is only one gate. If I'm a liar, I don't go from this gate, I go from other gates. No. It doesn't mean that. It means that if you have become a person who is truthful, then this truthfulness alone can save you. Because any virtue, if you fully develop it, it means that you have a divine quality in you. And no one with a divine quality go to hell. In other words, you cannot be really truthful and then have other problems. So, there are different ways to go to heaven, but not by conflicting and contradicting other gates. Do you understand? So, sometimes a person is very generous, but if you are really generous, then other good things will follow. But your strength has been in this. Maybe you are very, I don't know, kind person. Maybe you are very truthful person. But not that you have opposite qualities. Amirul Mumin salam said something which shows the connection of Sadr to the whole creation. He says, As-sidqo mutabakatu al-mantiq lil-wadh'i al-ilahi. Al-kithbu zawalu al-mantiq an al-wadh'i al-ilahi. Sidq means your speech, mantiq means a speech, sometimes means logic, but here means a speech. Your speech complies to the condition, the situation that Allah has designated, has put. Vadhil ilahi, the you know, divine situation, divine condition. And kizb is to ignore this divine condition. So when I am lying, it means that I am ignoring and in a sense opposing and if you look carefully, fighting what Allah has made, what is fact, I am fighting it. It looks like ignoring it, but in a sense you are fighting it. Because you are saying something opposite to it. If you are saying something opposite to the fact, it means you are fighting the fact. Yeah? And Alhamdulillah, we don't believe in alternative facts. <laughs> As someone said. So, fact is fact. Either you accept and acknowledge, or you are ignoring and fighting it.
Amir al Munir in another hadith said, Al Imanu and Tuxer a Sedq Haithu Yavuruk Al Al Kizbe Haithu Yan Faruk. Iman is to prefer truth or truthfulness when it might harm you to lying when it might benefit you. Sometimes, you know, we consider short-term benefit and short-term harm. Say, okay, if I tell lie, for example, I have been late to the office. I say, you know, tell a lie. For example, there was bad traffic, you know, underground, you know, was, for example, you know, closed, whatever. So I think, this lie benefits, saves my face you know, in front of my, for example, boss. But this is not acceptable from a mu'min. Sometimes you think, this is not a big deal, but it's a big deal. When you have a mirror whether you break it with a ham or you make a hole into that mirror, both of them are not acceptable. You cannot say, no, I made just a little, like an, a small hole inside it. I didn't break it completely. It's not acceptable. It has to be complete. This is integrity. If you tell lies for these things, you can tell lies for other things. Just the time has not yet come. And the bad thing about lying is, it's like a slippery road. Every lie normally needs another lie. But next time you have to make it bigger. Because that may not be enough. It's better not to go near lying. Of course, I think we should also uh, put in our tarbiyah and upbringing in family, in a school, in community, that when people admit their problems and confess, we treat them with some more mercy. For example, if my child has done something wrong, and tells me the truth, and he's beaten, the next time, he may not tell the truth. Yeah? So, we have to show that telling the truth can be treated with courtesy. I'm not saying no punishment at all, because sometimes then that means that they become really shameless. But they should know that, that this can bring some kind of pardon or reduction. Do you get my point? For example, you are a teacher, the student says and, uh, that I was cheating. Okay. If you ignore it, then okay, every time he cheats and says I was cheating. But if you see someone honestly says, I was cheating. Don't, for example, uh, remove all the marks. Maybe have a little mercy so that next time he gets more encouragement. You know, uh, they say a father noticed that his son is secretly selling objects from home because he was maybe addicted or whatever, needed money. So secretly was taking things from home and buying outside. So his father was very sad and upset. He said, you know, you take things from home and sell it very cheap outside. If you want to sell, sell it to myself. So he said, how much do you buy this carpet? 
So this father didn't mean really that you do all. He wanted to tell him this is bad, you know, why you are taking things from home outside and selling, you know, tens, one tenth of the price. And this person wanted to take advantage. So what I'm saying is that we don't want to give them chance to take advantage that become shameless, that in your face they say, I didn't say my prayer, you know, I didn't, you know, for example, fast, you know, that they feel normal. But on the other hand, they should not be afraid of sharing with us the truth and say, no, my father gets so angry with me that I cannot speak to him. So you have to find a wise balance that they realize that you appreciate honesty. Yeah, but there's a balance, not leaving no haya, but also appreciating honesty. We have many hadiths also about haq. So this was about sidq. Because sidq means telling the truth and acting according to the truth and even intending the truth. So it's more a matter of truthfulness, not just telling the truth. Telling the truth is the easiest part of truthfulness. The person who is truthful is not just telling the truth. The person who is truthful means he is searching for truth. Yeah? A woman should be searching for the truth. Has no rest unless finds the truth. Not truth about people. No, that's nosiness. <laughs> I don't want to know, you know, secrets of people. I don't want even to know everything that people say about me. Yeah, this is not good. La tas'alu an ashya an tubda lakum tasu'kum. Don't ask about things that if are disclosed to you will upset you. Why you need to know bad things that people tell about you? It will upset you, it will damage your relation. And therefore Islam doesn't allow people to share bad things that other people have said about members of community. Yeah? You hear something and then you go and tell that person, for example, you hear something from husband, you go and say to the wife. Or you hear from wife, you say to the husband. This is not good. Or you say to someone, your mother-in-law said this. This is not good. You ignore such things. But I'm saying truth about general truth. Yeah? For example, about religion, about your own problems, personal problems. These are things that we should be searching for them. If you look at people like Salman, what was making Salman special? Was Salman special when he prayed a lot, he fasted a lot? Or he was a special from the first day. Why? Because it was his truthfulness and his indeed search for truth that brought him to profit. It didn't take him long to become a special because he was already a special. He just needed a connection. His search for truth made him restless. He had very good position. He looked for truth. So he first chose one religion, then another religion. Finally he found what was satisfying him completely and then wholeheartedly. I think from the first day he was a special. Unfortunately, sometimes after 20, 30, 40, 50 years of being Muslim, 
We are not yet truthful. It means that 50 years of Islam does not put us even in the position that Salman had in the first day. <laughs> yeah? So, search for truth is important. Accepting truth when it is known to you is important. Whether you have found it or someone else tells you. Unfortunately, sometimes if you find yourself the truth, you accept. But if someone else tells you, you don't accept. Especially if someone is in your level or lower. I don't accept the truth. Or if I accept, it has to come from an authority. But if my friend or my children or youngsters tell me the truth, I don't accept. Truth has its own value. It doesn't matter who is telling you the truth. And if you don't accept the truth, you are not opposing that person. You are opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is al-haq. If a child tells me the truth and I don't accept, I am not just ignoring that child. I am ignoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this should always remain in our mind. If there is an issue between husband and wife, and one of them just ignores the truth, doesn't bother about the truth. I'm not saying that knows the truth and reject it, which is very, very bad. Even if you don't bother about the truth, I have a ready answer in all these cases to say to my wife, I don't bother. This is, means you are ignoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, searching for truth, accepting the truth, no matter where it comes, who is saying this, and then acting upon the truth. This is very important. Amir al muminin alayhi salam said, Man yatlubul izza bi ghayr haqqin yadhil wa man anada al haqqa lazimahu al wahn Whoever seeking for dignity and honor without truth would be humiliated. Sometimes we think, if I accept the truth, it's not good for me. Because I have to admit I made a mistake. I have to admit someone is better than me. I have to admit that I'm not qualified for this job. I have to admit that I don't know this question. But Amir al muminin says, you cannot seek honor and dignity by ignoring truth. Man yatlubul iz haqqin. Whoever is seeking honor and dignity without truth, yadhillu, becomes humiliated. Wa man anad al And whoever fights the truth, lazimahu al wahn. It's necessary that he would become weak. And loses his or her position. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam said, "Atqan nas man qala al haq fi ma lahu wa alayh." The most pious person is the one who says the truth, whether it is for his benefit or it's to his harm. He can gain from it or he may lose. He would tell the truth. This is a very important discussion. I don't have time. If you are interested, uh, we have few sessions on this in Akhlaq uh, series in the Hose. What I want to add, and that is actually our discussion also, the topic for our discussion, is that part of your respect for the truth is 
not to tell lies, but also not to disclose the truth to the people who are not trusted. So people don't understand the difference sometimes. We should tell the truth, but not to everyone and not all the time. You have to see what serves the truth better. What truthfulness requires. If a child just now in front of you jumped to the street and a truck hit him and died. You say, I'm a truthful person. You knock the door and tell the mom that your child was just killed. So this mom can die. You say, no, I am truthful. I have to tell the truth. This is not truthfulness. This is lack of respect for truth. If you are a truthful person, you know that telling the truth has manners, has etiquette. Everything which is important has manners. For example, you are a generous person. Okay, very good, mashallah. But generosity has manners. You cannot show your generosity to someone, for example, in front of his family and he would lose his honor in front of children and you give him money. So this man, person's honor is damaged. Or someone who has to work, you make him lazy and dependent. This is not generosity. Yes, if he wants to, he needs to learn, if he needs, you know, capital to start a business. But generosity doesn't mean to give money to someone to make him dependent. Yeah? So there are lots of manners that you have to observe. You want to feed people. Okay, you have to know when, how, what. Truth is very important, but it has manners. Sometimes... If you don't tell the truth properly, you harm the truth. Sometimes you tell the truth to someone that who would then fight the truth. Because that person is not capable. He would misunderstand. We have a hadith which is very, you know, moving. It says, لو علم أبو ذر ما في قلب سلمان لقتله أو كفره أو ترحم على قاتله. If Abu Zar knew what was in the heart of Salman, he would have perhaps thought Salman is not a mu'min. Salman is a kafir. Not because Abu Zar was a bad person or Salman was a bad person. But there are things that Salman knows that Abu Zar is not able to cope with. One of ulama was saying something interesting about the difference between Abu Zar and Salman. When it comes to Abu Zar, the advice which was given to him was you should not be doing leadership, undertaking leadership, even for ethnain. La tata'amaranna al ethnain. Even two people, you cannot be leader even of two people. He was not a good leader. But when it comes to Salman, Salman had permission to be governor even at the time of the caliphs was governor of Madain. So, people are different. There is something that Salman can know, but Abu Zar should not know. There is something that 
ulama should know ordinary shia should not know why are ulama used to write everything in arabic even iranians used to write in arabic why was it because they didn't know how to write in farsi no it had different reasons one reason was because there are certain things which are suitable only for ulama they should not be available for every person. For example, some ideas about philosophy, about Irfan, they didn't want it to write in Farsi. Sometimes because terminologies were in Arabic, sometimes because it was not for public. But what we do now, we translate all these things into different languages, make it available for Shia, non Shia from other groups of Islam and non even Muslims. I don't know what's the rationale, what is justification for making all these things available. Any book on fiqh, any book on hadith, any book on uh, history, any book on tafsir, just they make all available. Some people tell, if we don't do it, maybe others would do it. Let's retranslate all these things and make it available. I say, first of all, if they do it, you are not responsible. Secondly, they are using their own resources. Thirdly, we can then question the authenticity of translation. If they have mistranslated or you know something, we can see and anyway, we are not responsible. But when you translate and publish, then they would say, look, they themselves have translated it in this way. If a, an anti-Muslim brings a mas'ala from our fiqh, for example, from Tahrir al Wasila, and says, you know, this is the translation, and look. People say, he is uh, maybe biased, maybe he doesn't understand. You know, it puts a question mark. But if you translate it and put it, and then they say, look, this is their own translation or their own website, then what are you going to say? Then now you have a headache to explain this. Why we need to expose ourselves and everything and then become apologetic. Inshallah, I can share with you some hadith, but uh, in the past I have uh, shared in some other occasions that one of the things that you have to observe about haq is to observe when and how much to say, otherwise you will damage haq. Because then you have, you become, you know, in an apologetic position, and you have to say, no, I didn't mean that, no, this is not like this, this is not for today. Why you need to say something, then you have to come back and withdraw. Or put other people into trouble. So, let's read for you a few hadith and then, inshallah, we will have our discussion. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam says, Wadidtu wallahi Anni iftadaytu khaslatayn fi shi'a لنا ببعض اللحم الصاعدي. He says, by Allah, I like to compensate for two traits of character in Shia with flesh of my hand. How Imam can? warn us more than this. He's, first he says, Wallah. He says, I am happy if someone takes flesh of my hand, but Shia stop these two things. I 
ان نزق و قلت الكتمان one is to be hasty one is not to be able to keep secrets نزق means to be hasty a Shia cannot be hasty, rushing. Especially nowadays, you know, it's the time that they try to make you hurry, force you into quick decision. Everything has to be fast, everything has to be instant. Because they know that if you have time to think, you may not do what they want. So they give you five minutes to make decision. You know, I remember it was, I don't know, last year or two years ago, someone was, you know, calling me, you know, we have a special offer for, you know, your BT line, you know, that uh, you get this mobile also with this, but you have only 24 hours. I said, you know, I need to talk to our IT. No, this offer is only for 24 hours. Sometimes maybe it's genuine, sometimes it's just they want to rush you. Nowadays, for example, in the past, we used to write letters. We had chance to read again, maybe draft, and then, you know, f final version. It was taking time. Then, if you change your mind before you put it in the letterbox, you know, mailbox, you know, you could change it. Whatever. Now, immediately you have to answer. And even if you don't answer and sees that, you know, you have watched it. <laughs> Why you didn't answer? You had watched it. <laughs> yeah? So, this means that we have less chance to be careful about our answers. Yeah? So, you are drawn to say something, to do something. So, Imam Zainul Abedin says, Shia must not be people who are rushing. It doesn't mean that you delay too much, but take your time. Don't rush. And, Qillat al they cannot hide something. As soon as they know or hear something, they want to tell everyone. You know, it's the time that people think, MashaAllah, we have every, you know, platform to share. But what are you sharing? For example, do you share with people on internet what your father said to your mother last night, for example, what you eat from home? No. The same is about your mazhab. There are issues that are for insiders, for our own community. Why we should share everything with everyone? Imam Baqir alayhi salam said, Wallahi. It is interesting. Imam Zainul Abidin says, Wallahi. Imam Baqir says, Wallahi. It seems some of the Shia don't believe. So even Imam has to say, Wallahi. Inna ahabba ashabi ilayya. Truly, the most lovable companions of me, the most, uh, the dearest ones to me. Awra'uhum, the most pious. Wa'afqahuhum, those who have more knowledge. Wa'aktamuhum li hadithina. And those who hide our hadith more. Hide. Ketman. Those who are most pious, most knowledgeable, and keep our hadith secret. 
Because sayings of Ahlul Bayt are two types. One are those for sharing. One are those for absorbing. You absorb it. You like food, eat it. But not share it. It's not everything which is said by them is for sharing. Not because they are wrong. No, they are true. Not because there is problem them. No, but these are things that are for insiders. Some people don't have background to understand, to appreciate. You know, you have all have heard this from Imam Raza alayhi salam. لو علم الناس محاسن كلامنا لاتبعونا If people know our beautiful words, they would follow us. Some people say all the hadith of Ahlul Bayt are beautiful. So we should share all of them. I say no, you didn't understand the point. Yes, all of them are beautiful for us. But here Imam means something which is beautiful for Nas. If something is beautiful for Nas, and you select from Hadith those things that people, not just Shia, people appreciate first, and second find that this is better than what they have, then they would ask you, where did you get this? They so we get it from our Imams. But if there is something that you like it, but when you say to other people, it boils their blood, then they would follow Imams? They would say, we don't want to know about your Imams. We don't want to know about your Mazhab. You are very strange and odd people. So, we have to understand what is for sharing, what is for preserving for ourselves. So, Imam said, the dearest Shia, the dearest companions to me are those who are most pious, most knowledgeable. They are more capable of keeping our hadith secret not every hadith means when you have ability to keep secret then you know when to share and when not to share yeah one of the things that we have to evaluate ourselves is how long you can keep a secret It's very difficult to keep secrets. You know, you feel you want to explode. <laughs> but you have to learn how to keep secrets. Sometimes people leave with you as amana, their secrets. You should not tell anyone. And sometimes we have amanat of our mazhab. Imam Sadiq salam said, إِنَّ أَمْرَنَا مَسْتُورٌ مُقَنَّعٌ بِالْمِيثَاقِ فَمَنْ هَتَكَ عَلَيْنَا أَذَلَّهُ اللَّهِ Our affair, Amr in our hadith many times refers to Velaya of Ahlul Bayt. Our affair, our Amr is Mastoorun, is something which is covered. Muqanna qina means well. It is wailed. Bil mithaq means there is a covenant here to keep this protected. Whoever removes this whale, Allah will humiliate him. Adallahullah. 
Now, I ask people, what are these hadiths that you have kept hidden? Because we see you are telling everything everywhere. You know, some people, unfortunately, they have, you know, TV satellite channels, you know, they say things. First of all, many things they say, they are not even true. But even if they are true, who gave you the permission? They say, no, these are not for this time. This was for the past. Now it's not the time of taqiyya. Not to, actually, this is the time that more than ever we need taqiyya. Why? Because in the past, if you said something in one majlis, the harm was limited to that majlis. But now if you are not careful, it remains forever. This is the time that we have to be extra careful. Actually, sometimes when you think you cannot you know, really feel comfortable. Even just what I am telling with you, just in my heart, I am just thinking all the time, what if someone else hears this, what is going to be judged, you know? All the things can become public forever. And no one in this world, apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one, no government can totally take away something from internet. Even greatest governments in the world, if they decide to take something outside the internet, they cannot do it. So when it is said, <laughs> khalas. You have no control. So I think this time we need greater level of taqiyya than before. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, Ketmanu sirna jihadun fi sabil Allah. Ketmanu sirna. Hiding our secret, preserving our secret is a struggle for them. Man adha alayna hadithan. Imam Sadiq again. Man adha alayna hadithana. The one who spreads adha. Today they call radio adha. Radio, you know, they call it adha. Mezia is radio set. Radio station is adha. Man adha hadithana. Man adha alayna hadithan. Whoever spreads our hadith against us, which is harming us. He is like the one who denies our rights. So this Shi'i person thinks he is doing a service, but he doesn't know that Imam says, you are like the people who denied our rights. They think on the day of judgment they are going to be rewarded. But the Imam says, you are like the people who denied our rights. In another hadith, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Ma qatalana man adha'a hadithana qatla khata'in walakin qatalana qatla amdin the one who spreads our hadith has not killed us mistakenly, unintentionally. He has killed us intentionally. You know, in fact, there is a difference between intentional killing and unintentional. Maybe sometimes a person is driving, doesn't want to kill anyone, but accident happens, you kill someone. This is qatl khata. But sometimes someone deliberately wants to kill someone. Sometimes some people say something, then as a result, some Shia families in Pakistan, in other places are killed. They cannot say, we didn't kill them. They cannot even say, we killed them mistakenly. You are killing them intentionally and deliberately. Whether you understand or you don't understand. So 
So we need Shia who are able to watch their tongue and know what to say, when to say, how to say, how much to say. Okay, I stop here because we want to have also discussion. So the question for tonight discussion, inshallah, is put on yes, it's put on the screen. In your opinion today, in this modern age of information, internet, social media, where we have lots of opportunities for tabligh as well as exposure to people who may misunderstand or attack, what items would you include in a policy with regards to sharing and spreading our literature activities, etc.? So looking forward to listening to your points. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much. If we can now break for Tabaruk and join our groups, same as last time, inshallah we can spend about 15 minutes discussing and then reassemble.